policy and governance from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is quite a mouthful, but really the simple idea behind this is that we wanted to get together experts from different disciplines, as well as from uh, different jurisdictions to be able to uh, speak to each other, to be able to learn from each other, and for us to uh, you know, perhaps develop a template for uh, how we should tackle future public health emergencies. So very briefly, that's, that's the idea. We began today's symposium with a session on access to drugs and vaccines and what an equitable global response to this should look like. It was um, you know, an, an invigorating discussion on some of the intricacies of intellectual property law and the right to health. Um, for the second discussion, uh, for today's, this evening's discussion, we want to be discussing decision-making processes during public health emergencies, as well as the kinds of governance structures that can enable us to make speedy and efficient decisions and um, at the same time be transparent and, and inclusive. So I'm delighted to have a wonderful set of panelists uh, you know, uh, who, who are here to discuss this question with us. Um, I'd, I'd like to briefly introduce them. Uh, we have Professor Srinath Reddy, who's one of India's most eminent public health intellectuals and also president of the Public Health Foundation of India. He's also a junk professor of epidemiology at Harvard and has served on a lot of national and international uh, advisory groups and expert groups on a variety of health-related issues. And of course, most recently has been a member of the National COVID Task Technical Task Force that's convened by the Indian Council of Medical Research. So he has a real wealth of experience to share with us. And we are so grateful that you could be here today, Professor Reddy. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next panelist is Professor Karthik Murlidharan, who's Professor of Economics at the University of California in San Diego. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard and is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's also on the board of directors of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab, um, and he's a fellow and member of the Bureau of Economic Analysis and Development. Um, I've had the pleasure of listening to him speak on a variety of uh, policy related issues and you know he does a wonderful job of breaking down the complexity of what he works on and I'm really looking forward to he hear him do more of that today so thank you very much uh, Professor Murli Dharan for uh, joining us and our final panelist is Radhika Nagesh who works at uh, with the COVID-19 government response tracker at the University of Oxford where she leads data collection efforts for Indian subnational jurisdictions and also supports project planning and, anal and analysis. This is a really interesting project that she's uh, been working on um, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about it uh, from her. Thanks, Radhika. Um, so the format that we're going to follow today is we have um, a brief, um, we have you know a few introductory remarks that have been pre-recorded by the New York City Health Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Dave Chokshi, and he's going to be speaking about um, inclusive decision-making processes and some of his learnings from his experience as New York City Commissioner during a very tough time uh, for the city and for the country. Um, and then we will move on to uh, the, the panelists who have joined us this evening. We'll ask each of them to speak for about 10 minutes, um, and then maybe there'll be a round of follow-up questions. And if there are any questions from the audience, uh, then those, and we'll try and wrap this up in, in under an hour. So if you do have any questions, please paste them in the Q&A box and we'll um, try and take them towards the end of the session. Um, so Maitri, if I could ask you to begin playing the video by Commissioner Chokshi, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I will just play it in a minute. Thank you. <laughs> 
No, I think we have a slight technical glitch, but I, I, hopefully it should be sorted out soon. If it, it is, if it isn't in a minute, then we can. I, I, I'll move to Professor Srinath Reddy, and we can start our discussion and play Commissioner Chokshi's remarks uh, later. Maitre, is it likely to take longer or shall we continue with the, shall we go ahead with our discussion? Uh, Dwani, I'll need another minute or so. So uh, I, I think you can continue and then I'll play it. Sure, we'll, we will begin then and then maybe we can play his uh, remarks towards the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So Professor Reddy, if I could come to you first, uh, as I said, you know, the, uh, the objective of this discussion is for us to understand how evidence-based decision-making is carried out during an emergent situation. Um, and so given your experience uh, in, in this space and generally with having worked on the COVID-19 task force, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what India got right about evidence-based decision-making during the pandemic and whether there was something that it could have done better. Um, and also if perhaps if you could speak a little bit about some of the practical challenges that uh, people in government and policymakers face in obtaining and using data to guide decisions during an emergency, that would also be very helpful. So over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Clearly policy when it's being made at any time, but particularly in the context of a public health emergency has to be evidence informed, context relevant, resource optimizing and equity promoting. Now, this is often guided by data, by timely, accurate and fairly representative data that can feed into the decision-making loop. But clearly when we are discussing that policy has to be guided by many considerations, we need the data not merely in terms of how the virus is behaving in terms of its infectivity, illness, deaths, but also on a number of other elements, which include the social and economic consequences. So all of those will have to be tied together in the policy realm. But if you're even taking only purely the public health perspective of how the epidemic is to be gauged monitored and responded to, then clearly data are required in an emergency like this to find out what this new virus with which very few people had any familiarity in the world is behaving in terms of its uh, virulence, its infectivity and its resistance to prior immunity from any other virus infection that we might have had, even from the same coronavirus family, and how it is likely to be responding to various drugs and vaccines. All of these are elements that need to be gauged by gathering the appropriate kind of data across India and gathering also from information elsewhere in the world. Now, as far as India was concerned, I think our response had to be guided by whatever past experience the world had gathered with SARS-1, MERS, and other epidemics. So I think our reaction in January was fairly clear that we would start by restricting the flights from the area with the largest concentration of infection at that time, that was China, and then start observing how the pandemic is proceeding elsewhere till the first case landed on January 30th on our own territory. And then subsequently a series of restrictions were imposed. And then we also had the fairly long lockdown that started on the 25th of March. But again, here one must make a mention of the fact that India is a federal polity consisting of many states. Some states took an early lead 
and they reacted faster too than other states like Kerala did and to some extent Maharashtra did. And we recognize that since the pandemic arrived in the urban areas, it was mainly in the large metros and the states which contained those large metros that had to react early. But the center took another policy decision that in order to have a coordinated pan-India response, it invoked the Emergency Act as well as a Public Health Emergency Act or a, what's called the Epidemic Act, uh, uh, which is pretty old, and also the National Disaster Management Act and assumed several powers which were necessary from the point of view of having a coordinated national response. And to that extent, at least in the first wave, I think we saw a good deal of center state coordination falling into place. Whether the lockdown could have been announced with a more uh, longer notice, whether it could have been a shorter period, all those are open for debate. But given the kind of picture that was emerging from Europe and the United States of large scale havoc being caused by the pandemic, I think the response was fairly quick that we also had to go in for that kind of a lockdown, partly to reduce the rates of transmission at that time, but also to give ourselves time for preparation. Again, the policy response had to be fashioned on the availability of national resources. And when people were competing globally for testing kits, for personal protection equipment, for ventilators, the need for buying ourselves some time to prepare our health system for a better equipped response was, I think, what was planned. And it, that did get into uh, motion by way of encouraging the Indian industry to produce many of these faster and in larger quantities so that we could actually start even by June uh, testing at a larger scale. Of course, policy has evolved and has changed over a period of time. And it was guided and misguided by data, the way it is interpreted. Because you had all kinds of models predicting that herd immunity had arrived by January uh, 2021, which led to a great deal of complacency among policymakers, the public, and everybody else. And that led to the second wave, which swept through in an unguarded state. Of course, we had variants arriving, the Alpha variant first and the Delta variant. And the fact that we were unprepared for the arrival of those variants made us fall victim to a much larger extent than we, could, we might have. But again, that was the way the data were interpreted. So it's absolutely important that in a period of uncertainty, that we do need to gather data to find our way through that uncertainty, but the data must be interpreted with as much accuracy as possible and not necessarily have incomplete and inadequately processed data guide our decision-making. However, our, our, in other areas like our vaccine production, we have done fairly well. And there again, some guarded decisions had to be taken as to who would be prioritized first and who would be vaccinated later depending upon the amount of vaccine supply. So policy has been responding in various ways and there have been some faltering moments, but there have also been moments where actually we have seen a considerable amount of uh, data-driven decision-making happen. And the data related to, for example, the vaccination rates or the infection rates, all of them were fairly uh, reasonably well gathered. But there are challenges there because how many people are actually infected when the virus is causing people to get infected without symptoms? If a vast, large number are asymptomatic and they don't get tested, you will have data gaps unless you do antibody surveys. So the antibody surveys, which were then sequentially conducted, gave us a better approximation in terms of the numbers actually exposed to the virus. But then the question of how many people became really ill because of the virus, hospitalization data. Then how do you classify deaths? Is it related to COVID? Or is it because of another medical condition with COVID happening coincidentally? With, how do you attribute? And 
are we able to get a measure of the excess deaths? Quite often, our data has not been timely, and that is another challenge. Not only has it been incomplete, but not very timely. But within those data gaps, to navigate through uncertainty, but still take decisions which are required, yeah. is, is considerably a, a big challenge uh, in, a, in a public health emergency. And I think at different stages, we have performed differently. In some places, we have performed very well. In some places, we could have performed better. Sure. Professor Eddie, if I could just ask a quick follow-up, which is, uh, you know, you spoke about the importance of being able to interpret the, the data, you know, the, the, the kind of data that you were talking about accurately. Um, so, you know, what, what do you see as some, some of the challenges with communicating the, you know, the, the scientific epidemiological language of that data to people in government or to policymakers. So, you know, how does that, that language of uh, public health and epidemiology translate to, uh, to you know, how, how do bureaucrats understand that language? How do policymakers appreciate it? And, you know, how has that experience been uh, during this pandemic? I think the critical element is to communicate not only what we are interpreting in terms of the data, right. the level of uncertainty that we attach to the conclusions, but also list the probabilities in a manner that they can take the decisions based on those probabilities. Right. We recognize that there is going to be a lot of uncertainty. It is incumbent upon policymakers to make decisions even during that uncertainty. And we must assist them by stating the probabilities and helping evolve a decision tree where on the balance of probabilities, you say this decision is likely to be better than the other decision. Sometimes you say, okay, let's have a no regrets policy. Right. But basically it has to be based upon a clear statement of probabilities as best estimated and then assist the policymakers in making the right decisions based on the resources available. Right. No, that's very helpful, uh, Professor Reddy. I mean, it, it's certainly gives a very clear idea of how, uh, you know, how this kind of complex evidence can be presented to policymakers. And I appreciate your talking about the kind of data that you, you know, you as a public health professional have had to, um, you know, deal with and interpret and present uh, during the course of this pandemic. But if I could now turn to uh, Professor Murli Dharan and ask, him, you know, because Professor Reddy has spoken about the kind of epidemiological data that was, you know, uh, that, 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 that was a challenge to gather during the emergency and that, you know, that had to be updated periodically and with that, that allowed them to revise their decisions, uh, you know, a, a, as the situation changed. But could you perhaps first speak a little bit about the other kinds of data or evidence that were needed to that were needed to take the kinds of uh, you know measures that governments had to during the pandemic. So, data about you know socioeconomic status, data that could guide decisions about school closures, the data that could guide um, decisions about support to migrant workers. So, what is some of the other evidence that we must keep in mind when we are talking about decision making uh, during an an emergency? And maybe as a follow up to that, and you know, keeping in mind the criteria that Professor Reddy mentioned right at the beginning, what kind of what level of government do you think is most equipped to take some of these decisions or to obtain and use some of the data that we are talking about? Uh, you know, specifically talking about India's uh, federal uh, context. Uh, so, sorry, Professor Murlidhan, if you're on. Yeah, yeah, I'm muted. Yeah, I was muting when Professor Eddie oh. was talking. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that. Let me take that actually in reverse order, right? Because okay. I think the, because I think the, uh, the, the federal question is one where it's really useful to go back to first principles, right? So let's go back to first principles of optimal decision making in the federal architecture and then see how we did in this, you know, in, in our response to COVID, right? And I think 
It's easy to forget. See, we tend to think about federal systems as hierarchical, that, oh, there's the, the, the central government and then the state and then the local. But if you go to first principles of federalism, there's not supposed to be a hierarchy as much as a differentiation by functions. Okay, And so and this is not just constitutional. It also goes to first principles in the sense that, see, the, the, the logic of federalism is that when you can take a further step back and saying, what is the optimal size of a country, right? Would you rather behave, you know, rather live in a big country or a small country, okay? And the advantages of being in a big country are that you get economies of scale that comes from just having, you know, economies of scale for public goods, for defense, for international affairs, for negotiations. So you get the benefits of scale. But the main cost of being big is that you have to accommodate more variation within your country with one kind of set of policies, right? And so the, the concept of federalism is meant fundamentally to help you navigate that trade-off of the benefits and costs of size, okay? And so the idea is that the functions that sit at the level of a central government are functions that benefit from economies of scale and functions that need coordination. Whereas the functions that should sit at a more local level are functions that require accommodating variation and functions that require responding faster to local information, right? Because the other problem you get with centralization is just kind of the information flow is much weaker and the transmission back to decision-making is much slower, okay? Okay. So if you keep those first principles in mind, I think even before we go look at the pandemic response itself, one thing that people don't seem to generally understand is that in a cross-country setting, India is one of the most over-centralized federal countries in the world. Okay, So if you compare with other large countries like China, or the US or Brazil or Indonesia, you know, our local spending is about 3% of GDP, oh, 3% of the budget or 3% of GDP. Mm -hmm. I'm blanking on that, compared to say 25% or even 50% in other countries. Okay, so before blaming anybody for the reactions, I think it's important to say that in our DNA of governance, that we are deeply hierarchical and over centralized. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, which I won't get into. But I think the reason that's important is that the, the instinct of policymakers, right, I mean, is to over centralize. And this is true not just from center to state, it's also true from state to local. Okay, so we have a very strong kind of centralizing instinct in our administrative structures. And so one of the ways I think this panned out is I think, you know, we were probably suboptimally responding in both phases relative to these first principles. Okay. So I think, so it's absolutely true that in 2020, in the fog of war, we were trying to kind of make decisions with limited data. And there was definitely a need for national coordination on a whole bunch of responses. There's no question about that. Right. But it's not clear if you needed a national uniform lockdown based on the first principles of federalism, mainly because as Dr. Reddy said, this is already known to be primarily an urban situation, uh, primarily an urban, mm, urban issue. And so what you were doing with that kind of blanket lockdown was the, the, the costs of something like that are just enormous in terms of what that did to livelihoods in, a, you know, in, in low density areas where the cases may be low. And the other interesting thing, like Dr. Reddy mentioned, is that because this was done under the kind of disaster management act or under the uh, it, it became an issue that was a home ministry issue as opposed to a health ministry issue right so which meant that when you went down to the field a lot of the response was seen as a law enforcement issue that you had cops on the road trying to put people back in as opposed to a public health issue and the way you would respond to a public health issue is very very different from the way you would respond to what is it law enforcement so i think so in fa on, on federalism i don't want to blame anybody right it's just more a, a reflection of the fact that the instinct of our administrative structure is to over centralize and you saw severely the cost of that and i'll just give you an example right so i think by the second way we had understood that this uniform lockdown was kind of really draconian and so there it was by that time it was a more selective lockdown and if you see the estimates in terms of gst revenue if you use that as a proxy for underlying economic activity right um gst revenues fell by about 70 percent in that first wave and fell by about 30 percent in the second wave okay and so if you just think of that as a corresponding mapping in the amount of economic activity in the economy, that 40% is about 200,000, 300,000 crores, but you know, in that very, very narrow window. So just the the amount of economic activity lost due to that lockdown was higher than any kind of compensatory action you could do as a government, right? I mean, so, so the scale of getting these decisions the, uh, wrong, the, the implications is massive. But again, I don't want to blame anybody, right? I just want to go back to first principles of federalism. Now, but on the other hand, if you look at the response then in the second way, <laughs> where by then I think there was some sense of 
pushback from the states saying, you know, that this was over-centralized, over-centralized. And then you had this kind of six weeks of saying we will do decentralized vaccine procurement, okay, and allow states to go and, and do their own vaccine procurement. And this was, again, now violating the first principles of federalism because vaccine procurement in the international market is where you truly want the scale and the heft of the government of India saying, you know, we've got the purchasing power of 1.4 billion people and we're going to go and exit that scale. And there was this kind of, you know, I remember this four-week, five-week period when each state was trying to float their own tenders to do vaccine procurement and that made no sense but of course we quickly came back to saying this needs to be centralized so again i'm just using this as an example right because again all these decisions are made on the fly in the fog of war but when you do it, sit back and do a postmortem, you want to then connect that not to oh you got this wrong or this wrong but go back to the first principles of kind of governance in a complex federal polity and saying what do we learn from this okay and i think the most important thing we learn is that government is not hierarchical as much as different differentiated by function, and you really need to have this first principle of do we benefit here from economies of scale or coordination, in which case you put that function at the central level. If it's something that needs to respond to local information, then you make that a much more decentralized decision. Okay, And that gets me to immediately the next point on data. <laughs> And I think, you know, the truth is you can talk about what kind of data we needed for responding on livelihoods, responding on education. The truth is we just don't have the data, right? I mean, and so the, 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 it connects very deeply to our crisis of state capacity, right? We can talk about data, but creating reliable, transparent, disaggregated data itself is a core component of state capacity, right? So where does the term statistics come from? The term statistics comes from the fact that analysis, the primary use case of analysis analysis of large scale representative data was to manage the affairs of the state. Okay, so that's where the term statistics itself comes from. It's not coming, it's coming from the state, right? And so essentially, what you needed in terms of data is you mm, you needed representative data on infections, so you needed transparent and you needed it disaggregated, right? And we didn't have any of those three things. And so, which means that, you know, we can do Monday morning quarterbacking about all of, you know, what we should have done, but fundamentally, we just don't have the data architecture, right? We needed to have responded in what would be, you know, in, in surgical terms, you kind of want to use a scalpel as opposed to kind of taking a big kind of hatchet to your problem. But to kind of take that scalpel, you need that disaggregated data that's representative. And, and we didn't have that, okay? Now, you could argue that this is a long-term failure in terms of state capacity and that that the pandemic is a wake-up call of the need to invest in that kind of data collection. But you could also argue that some of the problems of data were also just in terms of the instinctive kind of disregard. Again, I don't want to blame one government to the other, right? I mean, I think it's in the DNA of the government, to, in, of every government, to kind of not be very transparent, right? So if you look at the struggle for the RTI Act, no bureaucrat in general instinctively wants to give up data and be transparent. You had to struggle for the RTI for a long time to kind of say that data itself is a public good that deserves to be in the public domain. This is not something that's proprietary information that somebody in the government is going to use to kind of decide. So I think in terms of data architecture, the single, those, I'll just go back to those three principles again, right? Which is transparent, disaggregated, and representative. And we didn't have any of those, right? So you had, so which then meant that so if you had that, then you could say, and like people like Anup Malani have been, you know, have, were writing about at that time, you could have really calibrated the um, spatially differentiated responses. Now, again, we tried to do the green zone, yellow zone, red zone, and stuff like that. But even that, I think, came a little too late and again was being directed by the center as opposed to kind of that could be a decision that was done at lower levels of government based on disaggregated data. So I think. You know, we can talk a lot about what kind of data should have been analyzed or used. We just don't have the data, right? It means I remember, you know, a lot of us who've been doing different work in social protection. I think, you know, we in one of the states I was working in, we did some simulations based on just NSS distribution um, of the sectors that were shut down, doing some estimations of the transmission and estimating how. 20, 30% of households were literally going to go into complete destitution because they didn't have savings for over a month. Um, and so that informed some state level responses with regard to cash transfers or with regard to PDS. But this is still very much kind of minimal palliative responses. And the first order thing would have been to kind of say, can I calibrate the lockdown in the first place so that you know you don't have such a massive impact on livelihoods? So, so yeah, so these are very, very complex questions. But the principles I want to go back to are just the state capacity for data, which hopefully Hopefully, this is a bit of a wake up call and gets us to make those investments. And even if we don't do that at the level of the center, hopefully some states will start kind of saying this, we, we need a more robust um, just data and statistical architecture, which have been atrophying over the years. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll stop there. And there's a bunch of other specific points I can come back to.
great great thanks very much uh, kartik and actually maybe that's a good segue for us to play commissioner chokshi's video which i as i understand we are now able to play glitch free because i think he's making an important point about uh, gathering local information by going out and speaking to people in the community so i think the focus of his address is very much on how we can make decision making processes more inclusive and how they did that at a hyper local level and maybe it would be good to hear what he has to say about that so maitri if i could ask you to play his address and then radhika will sorry to make you wait we'll come back to you after that Hello, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, the 43rd Health Commissioner of New York City. I wish my schedule permitted me to join you in person, but I'm honored to have been invited by Dr. Dvani Mehta of the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy to say a few words virtually. Thank you to everyone at the Vidhi Center and to the University of Oxford's India Oxford Initiative and Asian Studies Center for organizing this important symposium. Although I'll be stepping down from my role as commissioner in just a couple of weeks, it will always be one of the greatest privileges of my life to have served this great city during the historic public health crisis of COVID-19. Privilege might seem like a strange word to use given the extraordinary tragedies so many have experienced the past 2 years. But it's the word that comes to mind when I look back on how my colleagues and I were welcomed into communities across the city. especially those communities that bore the worst impacts of the virus the miracles of action healing and kindness that we witnessed both large and small taught me so much about the practice of public health and how for all of the formal governmental structures and policy deliberations the most effective and humane decisions can only be made in collaboration with communities themselves the leaders and everyday people who are the best experts on their own conditions and needs and whose voices and insights were instrumental in driving our response efforts in New York City early on in the pandemic the health department launched a hyper local approach to data and outreach disaggregating infection hospitalization and death statistics by zip code and targeting resources and messaging to the most affected communities our place-based community-driven vaccine campaign built on this approach and prioritized the same communities sadly if unsurprisingly these were predominantly poor communities of color a terrible reminder of the persistent health inequities that are deeply rooted in centuries of structural racism governance from top down at least as it exists cannot remedy on its own the patterns of injustice that have permeated our health systems let alone the systems of housing education wealth distribution and other areas that directly affect people's health and well-being this can be seen for example when we compare new york city's experience with our vaccine policies locally compared to the covid vaccine programs of the federal government Federally these were limited and the ability to put into place vaccine mandates uh, were fundamentally hamstrung to the extent that the federal mandates were effective it built upon local efforts like ours which in turn largely owed to the board's role in ratifying over a dozen earlier vaccine mandates from healthcare workers to public employees to the private sector We did this deliberately alongside months of widespread vaccine availability as well as messaging tailored to specific neighborhoods available in appropriate languages and delivered by trusted and knowledgeable community partners elaborating these policies and legal mechanisms depended on that community outreach the authority of the new york city board of health in this and so many other public health advancements and protections cannot be overstated especially during public health emergencies the board was originally forged in the crucible of epidemic response yellow fever cholera and smallpox the scientific links between the environment and public health became irrefutable and advances in sanitation saved countless lives particularly those of poor and immigrant new yorkers Now we are in another crucible another pandemic in which suffering is not born equally 
We are nearing a million deaths from COVID-19 in the United States, but even that devastating overall toll belies that Black, Indigenous, and people of color are all at least twice as likely to die compared to white people. And focusing solely on mortality obscures other reverberating effects on public health. A health department analysis found that in 2020, Black and Latino New Yorkers were 1.3 to 2 times more likely than white New Yorkers to report being unable to pay rent, phone or internet bills, and afford groceries. These numbers demonstrate the catastrophic combustibility of historical patterns of injustice, particularly structural racism intersecting with disease. As the saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. In 1865, our forebears on the Board of Health wrote, we believe that housing, politics, morals, and health are all intertwined. This same philosophy, bolstered by years of work at the health department and our understanding that local institutions like the Board of Health can play a vitally important role taking on the most fundamental public health issues, drove my colleagues and I to develop a resolution on racism as a public health crisis that the board passed unanimously last October. The resolution is far more than a declaration. It includes a number of clear and concrete actions we are committed to take to combat white supremacy in public health and health care, hold ourselves accountable, and most importantly, shift the paradigm of how public health policy decisions are made so that equity, and particularly racial equity, are at the center. My experiences during the pandemic as a public hospital physician, as well as commissioner, seeing my own patients have to choose between protecting their families and protecting their job, for example, reminded me that the best public health decisions are made only after listening with deep humility to patients and communities and inviting them to play a central role in their own care. I frequently recalled why I entered this profession in the first place. I had grown up witnessing the inequitable health burdens placed on my own family members, immigrants from India who struggled with chronic uh, diseases such as diabetes and other conditions. As the first New York City Health Commissioner of Asian descent, I understood that I had a responsibility and an opportunity to help confront these crises, uh, particularly racial inequity, that are the number one issue in public health. Such a challenge demands clear consolidation and consensus around core institutional values, particularly when making decisions with such wide ramifications. I think of values as like magnets. They exert powerful forces, often through an unseen mechanism. Fellow health department leaders and I came together as soon as I became commissioner in August of 2020 to name our own core values and to put them front and center in everything we did. Science, equity, and compassion became our guideposts when serving our communities and making any decision of consequence. Science, equity, and compassion has become a mantra across the health department and among the hundreds of community health workers who make up our new New York City Public Health Corps, a $235 million investment in the power of communities. This greatly expanded workforce, who come mostly from the communities they serve, collaborate with community-based organizations, the health department, and other city agencies to help their neighbors with the diagnosis, management, treatment, and prevention of COVID and other diseases. They provide mental health resources and services and critically serve as trusted health advisors and messengers. Building local trust builds trust in government. And public health is rooted in the soil of trust. Without it, even our best policies will fail. I hope today's symposium helps you imagine ways to build even greater trust across your own communities. What I think of as ensuring that our policies and our institutions are worthy of the trust of the communities we serve so that the decisions that we all make as leaders can have their widest possible effect. And first, decide upon your own core values and revisit them and nourish them, um, particularly 
uh, when the going gets tough. My advice for the younger leaders and students among you, don't make the mistake of spending too much time burnishing your credentials, particularly if it's at the expense of time nourishing your convictions. In times of crisis, you will rely on your convictions far more than your credentials. We need leaders of conviction more than ever. As recent events have once again reminded us, we are part of a global community where what happens across borders affects what happens within them. We are not done with COVID-19 and emergencies will keep coming our way from war to climate change. Improving community health and confronting health equity can and will have worldwide effects. I wish you all the best of luck and look forward to continuing to contribute however I can with all of you, creating a better, healthier world together. Thank you. Um, so that's quite an uplifting message from Commissioner Choksi, but it, it just reminds me of the vastly different contexts in which we talk about local government, I mean, to the extent that you can uh, equate, uh, you know, the New York City uh, Health Department and, and a municipal corporation uh, in India. I mean, and, and so then that I, I think that brings me uh, nicely to, you know, to get Radhika to talk about the work that they are doing at the Blavatnik School of Government, which is to uh, compare uh, government responses to COVID uh, all around the world. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting exercise. And in the context of this discussion, she's, you know, going to be telling us a little bit about uh, how they're gathering evidence about the way in which governments take decisions based on evidence. So, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a meta uh, lens to this. So, uh, Radhika, if you could speak a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the work that you're doing with the tracker and in particular, tell us some, you know, what some of the interesting commonalities and variations in government responses have been, especially as, you know, as, as regards the use of, uh, you know, evidence-based decision-making or the degree to which process, you know, responses have been inclusive in the manner in which, uh, you know, Dave Chokshi was just talking about. Sure, thanks so much, Sunny. I'll just share my screen. Sure. Is it visible? Not yet. Um, My three is screen sharing is enabled. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Great. Um, thank you, Dwani. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a privilege to speak alongside this distinguished panel. Um, my name is Radhika Nagesh, and I'm a research, research assistant with the Oxford COVID-19 Government Response Tracker at the Blavatnik School of Government. Uh, for the project, I assist on producing research outputs, but also lead the India sub-national jurisdiction data collection efforts, which is a data set we're excited to soon be launching. More about that as the presentation continues. In today's presentation, I will cover three main areas, uh, a description of the project, what we do and why we do it. Um, some challenges that we've encountered while trying to systematically collect policy data across uh, countries around the world. And if time permits, I'll also present some interesting findings about the commonalities and variations in government policy response um, that we've observed through our data. Um, so the first thing is the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker and what do we do? Um, the core principle that we work with is to produce a systematic data set about COVID policy, collecting and codifying data from publicly available resources, primarily official government policy documents where available. Uh, the project was launched in March 2020 in a bit to better understand what was happening and how this new wave of policy responses to the pandemic could be studied. Um, the project is housed at Oxford's Levatnik School of Government, so there was an obvious interest in studying government responses at the school. And of course, we wanted to build our own research questions around these um, new policy responses that were taking shape. To do this, as we've discussed uh, on this uh, discussion already, we needed good data. And that just didn't exist at the time. And this project was a response to that data gap. The data didn't exist, so we decided to create it. The project now provides systematic cross-national and cross-temporal measures of government responses and their evolution since the start of the pandemic to date. And although there's been a lot of interesting research born from the project, our critical offering is around two primary research questions. What leads government to adopt different policy responses and what effects do these responses have across different populations? 
The crux of our approach is the standardization of responses for comparability. As I said before, we produce a global data set that quantitatively records policies in a systematic way. We currently record 23 policy indicators, which are broken up around containment and closure, economic response, health response, and vaccination policies. Uh, we cover around 190 countries and have also launched subnational data projects in um, Brazil, Canada, UK, and the US and China. Uh, in the pipeline are subnational data projects for India, which I said I was leading, um, and also Australia, soon to launch. Um, our ordinal systematic coding is truly our real strength. Every country defines lockdowns differently and announces things like in the UK, for instance, that England is in tier two, whatever that means. Um, and our coding really helps disentangle some of that contextual jargon around policy communication. So the difference between a requirement versus a recommendation, what is a mandate versus what is a suggestion from policymakers to um, perform a certain action. Um, we also not just capture the existence of certain policy, but also the degree of the response as measured through the stringency of our indicators. The indicators are then also aggregated into simple linear indices. This is primarily to facilitate communication to policymakers and other users of our data. The most popular index that we generate with our data is the stringency index, which goes from zero to 100 and basically uses the containment and health indices to map um, government response over time. And everything has been recorded as a daily time series starting from one, the 1st of January, 2020, right through to the present day. The data is present, uh, freely um, available on GitHub and is published daily. As I mentioned, we build this data product to really inform real-time decision-making around the world. And it's not just used to answer research questions for academics um, around the world, but also used by journalists, reporters, and governments around the world as a source of intelligence and monitoring. Uh, we partner closely with an with a, um, with an offering called Our World in Data, which uh, uses our data to map um, temporally government policy responses across the various indicators around the world. As I mentioned before, our approach is, um, or maybe I haven't mentioned this about before, the only reason we're able to do this is because we have a great team behind us. There's of course a core team housed at the Blavatnik School of Government, but the real engine of the project is our volunteer base. We have around 200 trained volunteer data collectors at any point in time, and about a thousand would have worked on the project since its inception. Our um, real motivation behind this is that human judgment is, bet is more impactful than automation. Um, we could, for instance, collect policy documents from governments across the world and run a script to extract information on whether a policy was um, mandated, recommended, et cetera, but it would really, it, it enhances our data collection efforts when we have human decision-making to interpret the policy document and then codify it. There have obviously been challenges as we built the system um, starting from the uh, start of the pandemic to now. Um, I'll cover a couple of these now, and I think they'll be pretty universally applicable to data collection efforts um, of this nature uh, generally. The first one being that there is massive variation within the countries that we're trying to code uh, data for. For our policy indicators, the guidance that we give our coders is that we want to record a single value on the ordinal scale that reflects the toughest restriction um, that has been imposed ac across along an indicator in a particular jurisdiction. But how if when we're coding for countries, it becomes really difficult then to uh, account for subnational variation. For instance, how do you code a lockdown that's only in Delhi or micro containment zones in Mumbai, for instance? Um, and we do this by using a binary flag that um, is either targeted, uh, that identifies a policy as either targeted or general. But this still obscures a lot of in useful information. Um, I presented an example of this chart. Uh, for the US, this shows how many schools, how many states have school closures. The line indicated, uh, the blue line indicates school closures. Business closures indicated in green and stay at home orders indicated in red. So basically the whole period at the national level, we would report in our data that there is a stay at home order in some region, but we wouldn't be able to say whether that geographic region is 75% of the states as it was in April or 10% of the states as it was in July. The reason we're able to observe this in the US also is only because we collect the subnational data for the US. And so we have, apart from the national government policy, 50 additional subnational jurisdictions on which um, to observe the difference. When we decided on the data scheme, it seemed like a good balance to have a simple decision rule and coding system um, versus capturing detailed information across all potential subnational jurisdictions. 
And we thought it would be enough to have information on the most stringent policies that are uh, implemented in the jurisdiction, particularly if they were likely to be in population centers like Delhi or Mumbai. And it doesn't really matter what else is happening elsewhere because case levels might not warrant um, strict, strict policies across the board. But as we've seen, of course, um, based on experiences around the globe and in India particularly, that has not been the case always. The other challenge that we find is that common approaches change over time. And this is, of course, from a more data project perspective, this challenge, um, and less from a data interpretation perspective. But when we initially launched the project, uh, there were seven indicators uh, that we were capturing. And this had to quickly expand to 11 in the very first month, which was really the core data, uh, the core project um, launch time. Um, and ever since then, we've consistently been paying catch up to accurately record what governments are doing across the board. For instance, our first batch didn't include things like explicit stay at home orders because in February and March when the pandemic was just sort of taking off, stay at home orders just weren't a thing, but all countries had school closures that they were initially initially launching straight away. Um, what you can see is in this in the graph that I presented here, school closures eventually started to taper off as the primary policy response, but at the same time, mask mandates started to tick up. And around July 2020 is when mask mandates became pretty much the norm around, around the globe. And we wanted to then start to capture mask mandates around the globe in our data, but to, from July 2020, even at that point, to go back seven months to start capturing data from the start involved mobilizing our team of 100 volunteers at that point to go back and recode data from the outset for the jurisdictions, for the 187 countries that we were um, trying to capture data for at that point. And it took until October 2020 to finally launch a mask indicator in the data. Now, of course, if we want to add any more indicators, the effort is even more uh, stupendous. We not only have the 187 countries that we're collecting data for, but also several sub-national uh, jurisdictions. And so at this point, if we want to add a new indicator, which we have done, it takes it's about 400,000 data points that we need to um, include from the outset of the pandemic. Um, if I have time, I'd like to go into a few patterns and findings that we've seen uh, come out of our data. Yeah, this would be very interesting, Radhika. Please do uh, share some of this. Um, so I'll go into more detail in the following slides, but very briefly, these are the big patterns that we've observed in policy response uh, from governments around the world over the course of the pandemic. In the early stages of the pandemic, so from March to April 2020, there was um, a convergence on a very similar set of policy actions. There was, of course, like I mentioned, school closures were the first things uh, to be announced, uh, followed by stay-at-home orders, et cetera, that were launched all over the world before eventually more policy responses um, started to be um, taken up. But initially, at least uh, in the pandemic, all countries converged on a very similar set of policy actions. In the middle part of 2020, we saw countries start to diverge, and we observed some very strong regional trends um, in uh, policy actions at that point, which I'll, I'll go into more detail later on. Over time, what we've seen is that compliance with very stringent policies has fallen. And um, the, while there might still be some sort of past dependencies in how countries continue to respond to the pandemic, what we're observing in late 2021 and early 2020 with the emergence of new variants is that countries are converging again, but this time in the opposite direction towards reduced stringency um, around, across the board. So, like I mentioned, to start, to begin with, in the first few months of the pandemic, the best predictors, um, the best predictor of policy that we were using was the containment and health indicators, since that captured all of the indicators that we were using um, at that time. We found that there was a global bandwagon effect where almost every country implemented stringent policies at the same time, regardless of local conditions. So if you look at this chart, every row uh, signifies a country. Uh, the blue dots are the, a measure of our containment and health index, uh, the blue dot representing the containment and health index over 50, so more stringent, and the red being containment and health index less than 50. Um, and the white diamond dot is the first step. So you'll see that there's remarkable alignment in mid-March before most countries had even had their first death. You'll see that most of them started implementing extremely high containment and health measures. But as, as you move later on towards the pandemic in the subsequent months, there is a lot more variation. Country policy becomes more shaped by domestic epidemiological, epidemiological factors and political factors and other considerations that came into play. Like I mentioned, there were some regional trends that we started to see, particularly in the use of stay-at-home orders through the middle of 2020 to March 2021. 
Um, this graph represents the proportion of countries that were implementing stay-at-home orders uh, in a particular region. And we've uh, basically got, Af the, got Africa, the Americas, Asia and Oceania and um, Europe. Um, despite early alignment, you, we can see that in the middle of the last year, around the Northern Hemisphere summer, Europe basically stopped using stay-at-home orders altogether. Conversely, stay-at-home orders and curfews remained very popular across the Americas, driven largely by Latin America. But this is also the case in India, where uh, stay-at-home orders were very prevalent. This might have to do something with the second wave, but um, stay-at-home orders are still very much um, in effect. And of course, um, if we're taking population averages, then India drives the trends. We also see, I mean, government policy response is one end, but we also observe some patterns in compliance using uh, uh, some surveys and Google mobility data. We see patterns in how people comply with dif different policies change over extended months um, as we go on. So the short version is that for costly or more difficult policies like physical distancing, stay at home orders, compliance starts to drop almost immediately. Whereas for, on the other hand, for relatively low cost requirements like mask wearing that people can also get habituated to relatively easily, compliance rises over time. And even if policy doesn't move alongside, people's personal preferences can drive um, behavioral patterns of, towards compliance or policies that they deem uh, effective um, against the pandemic. We've also observed some past dependency in how sensitive countries are to infection case levels um, in, their, in their country. So I've presented as an example of four countries here, uh, the Philippines, the UK, Australia, and China. Uh, the date is on the x-axis and the case count is on the y-axis. And the red bars represent periods of stay-at-home orders uh, from the start of the pandemic through March 2021. Each dot shows you the case count when a new stay-at-home order was introduced. Um, and you'll see that trends in the Philippines and the UK are consistent with the idea of desensitization. It takes more and more cases to trigger a stay-at-home order in these countries as time goes on. But as the reverse is true for Australia and China, where they've become hypersensitive, it takes very few cases to trigger a lockdown. In Australia, it goes from 330 to 63 to 20. Um, similarly, in China, they, as we know, they have a zero COVID policy. And so even one case can trigger a lockdown, a regional lockdown in a country. Um, in a region in the country. In the next slide, we look at this for all countries that had multiple stay-at-home stay orders, but the y-axis will be relative to the first one. So if you like, every country's first dot will be one on the scale uh, from this graph, and the next dot will be either higher or lower to see how case levels were determining stay-at-home policy. Um, and uh, you can see almost every, every country follows on the right-hand side, follows the trend of desensitization or decreasing sensitivity. Subsequent lockdowns occur at 10 or even 100 times as many cases as the first lockdown. There are, of course, few exceptions to this, which is the countries on uh, in the blue um, here. Um, they're the ones that had relatively low case levels after April 2020, and they tend to be triggered to instate stay-at-home policies at lower and lower infection levels going forward. Um, Radhika, if I could just... Uh... Sorry, I, I, you know, maybe maybe I can come back to you, but I wanted to quickly, uh, you know, ask uh, Professor Reddy as well as Professor Murli Dharan some follow up questions that you know have mm -hmm. come out of our conversations as well as the fascinating findings that you've presented. Um, so, you know, Professor Reddy, it's very clear that you know cultural contexts really determine uh, the kinds of decisions. Well, cultural contexts, other socioeconomic factors, uh, you know, political. A background affects the kind of uh, affects the way in which countries respond to an, an emergency of this nature, even though, you know, we, we, we have a World Health Organization and we have a model pandemic preparedness plan. Um, so in, as a lawyer and as a legal policy organization, we're always interested in thinking about what is it that the legal architecture can do to enable the kind of um, flexible decision making that's needed during a pandemic of, uh, of, of this nature. Because as you know, of course, you know, the, the, the law is very static. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's been clear through this conversation that the kinds of decisions that have to be made uh, during a public health emergency have to be very dynamic and have to constantly evolve. So, you know, is there any role that the law has to play in guiding how evidence should be gathered, how data should be used, um, how it should be revisited, or you know, is this uh, is this an area that the law should steer clear of? Uh, if you could just unmute yourself. Okay. 
uh, policy can be very enlightened or very capricious. Even for an enlightened policy, it depends upon scientific credibility of the evidence, financial feasibility of what the resources are available, operational steerability <clears throat> is the implementation system reasonably well-equipped and efficient, has it to be geared up and in what time, and political viability. What are all the political factors that are operating, whether the community preparedness or the business interest saying, you can't shut us down for long, you're going to have an economic loss. So all of these factors will have to be balanced. But ultimately, you will have to look at <clears throat> what is public interest and define public interest. And let that public interest guide you as much as possible. And in the midst of a pandemic, public health takes greater precedence immediately over e even economic interests. But there, it is absolutely important to make sure that the vulnerable sections are the most protected and they're not rendered more vulnerable. And I fully agree with some of the preceding comments that have been made that you do require decentralized data. There's no doubt about it. And preferably you require data with complexity that can operate at different levels at the block level at, or the municipal corporation level, then at the district level, then at the state capital level and at the national level with different levels of complexity because the speed of response is also important. At the local level, you require a fairly ready and rapid response. And that is where the example from New York has been given and that's happened in uh, Mumbai as well. Ward level decisions were taken in Dharavi, etc. Also, a lot of decentralized decision making was done. And you do require that, there's no doubt about it. But you also require for resource allocation, for course corrections, some amount of data to be monitored in a more expanded fashion at the district level or at the state capital level. And for overall policy coherence and coordination, you require at the national level as well. So different levels of complexity would be required. And in this, you cannot have a law which is going to keep the policy response fairly static. You have to allow that amount of flexibility. Where the law or the regulatory framework has to step in is to make sure that the decisions are being made with public interest foremost and that the vulnerable sections are protected and not rendered more vulnerable. And that is where I believe some of the safeguards will have to be applied in this, through whatever the statutory instruments are that are developed. But you have to permit a certain amount of elbow room for decision making. You can't codify everything. International health regulations are fine for reporting mechanisms, but for actual response mechanisms, you have to have that flexibility because you're dealing with complex adaptive systems, which are changing fairly frequently. And, you're, and these complex adaptive systems are not only the health system. There are also a variety of other complexities that are happening in the social and political space. So you have to permit that amount of uh, adaptability and flexibility. So you do require decentralized, data-driven decision-making supported by people-partnered public health. Because people will have to monitor what is being done and see whether that is ultimately in public interest or not. But whatever are being codified in terms of the statutes will have to be interpreted in light of public interest, even as the pandemic proceeds. Thanks very much, Professor Reddy. That's very illuminating and a good guide for us as we try to think about uh, what an enabling and responsible legal architecture for public health emergencies should look like. Um, I was going to ask Professor Mulidharan a follow up, but I, I think I'll move to one. Yeah, no, because I think yeah, I think we're at time. So I'm just going yeah. to say a, a, a 20 second addition to that last question. See, I think right. the most important place where a legal framework can help is, you know, like Professor Reddy said, you, know, you can't codify all of these things because you, you, the law has to focus on principles, right? And not very, very micro specified things. But where I think a legal framework could be very, very useful is kind of a legal framework for data collection and transparency, right? So, uh, and that way you're not kind of judge, you're not legally tying what the decision needs to be, but you are enshrining certain principles that there will be transparency in the data, okay? So, because there frankly was very little, this is not like a, 
you know, place where you have to worry about enemy troop movements or something where there's any like national security reason to not make the data more transparent. Okay, so I think pushing for transparency and pushing for, you know, a certain budgetary allocation for certain kinds of systematic data collection, right? I mean, I think could be a place where a legal architecture could be very useful. Sure. And maybe you could, you know, there's one question that we have from one of our attendees, and I think perhaps Professor Murlidhan, and if you could address that, that would be quite uh, helpful. So, you know, they ask what kind of questions should we ask at local levels in order to get useful data at the central level? Um, so would you have any? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the entire question. See, I think like the sub question part B is absolutely on point, right? Which is the larger problem we have is a culture within the government that holds people, you know, that doesn't want to see bad news, right? So we've now started seeing in sector after sector, again, not picking on a particular government, right? This happens in every state. It happens in every sector, okay? So um, we've got... Mm, Evidence now from independent studies in education, uh, you know, my own work in ICDS, you see that Anganwadi is routinely like, you know, underreport the rates of malnutrition by factor of two or three or four. So I think we do have a systematic problem here, right, where the incentives within the government are to kind of underplay any problem. And this is, again, completely nonpartisan problem. Okay, so and that's just a systemic problem. right? So I have a bunch of ideas, which I'll talk about, you know, which I, I have a book that will hopefully be out later this year, where I have a whole chapter on kind of a data and outcome measurement architecture that reflects our modern technological possibilities, including kind of independent sample-based validation of administrative data. But I mean, the, my bigger point is, I think we invested in our statistical infrastructure in the post-independence years and 70 years later, you know, we just haven't revisited the investments we need to make in revamping our statistical infrastructure relative to the modern technical capabilities that we have. So I think my broader answer is that there's a lot of work to be done. And this is a place where I think things through the legality of things as well as this uh, you know the practicality of what is possible and then um, coming up with model if not legislation some kind of templates of what um, a 20 sec a 21st century data collection architecture looks like that's cost effective disaggregated real time and you know having a template that maybe can be adopted even by some states if it becomes too complicated to do this at the level of the entire country i think that would be a very fruitful way forward um, as as we go ahead and in fact radhika you know it's interesting you may, i i loved your presentation I, I wish you had more time um, but the one thing in fact i remember telling max rosa this right I mean that i really wish that these international data collection entity uh, efforts would automatically default to subnational in places like India and China and Brazil. So, you know, you can, Indian states are bigger than most countries, right? I mean, so just if you use population as a criteria for whether you invest in disag disag uh, subnational data, I think that will automatically get you started from day one and saying India, anything that's not at the state level is kind of, you know, is, 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 um, is uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, so it's a fantastic effort. And I will just encourage you from day one to go disagree uh, into subnational work in India. So. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious that you know we are we are we are at time, and we have both Karthik and Professor Reddy. One who's you know it's very early for Karthik, and it's quite late for you, Professor Reddy. So uh, I, I, I'm going to wrap up now. But thank you very much for joining us in this discussion. I think you know this was just the start. There's I think there's a lot more that 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 can be discussed. I hope to be able to continue these conversations with you independently and hope that this has also been a forum for uh, people who are attending to start thinking about these uh, issues. And hopefully, again, again, the, the, the idea behind the symposium was to encourage people from different disciplines to uh, talk to each other. And I, I can vouch for myself that, you know, as a lawyer, this has been a very uh, illuminating discussion for me and uh, it's given us lots of food for thought as we uh, continue with our project on thinking about what a legal response to public health emergencies should look like. So I'm very appreciative of, uh, of, of your participation today. Uh, we might have, we, we are, we're likely to have a second round of the symposium where we'll perhaps have a more in-depth roundtable discussion on, on, on legal responses to public health emergencies. So uh, to those of you who are attending, I'll ask you to please keep an eye out for that. Um, and to our panelists, thank you again very much for your time. Thank you to our sign language interpreters as well for doing such a valiant job of uh, rapidly translating what everyone was saying. Um, apologies if you know if we didn't go slower. Um, but thanks everyone. Good morning, good night, wherever you're, uh, good afternoon, wherever you're attending from. And uh, uh, 
ha have a have a good day. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.